Welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Our team's goal is to present science-based information about gardening and all things nature in New York's Hudson Valley. Host Gene and Tim, along with team members Teresa and Linda, are master gardener volunteers for New York's Columbia and Greene counties. So if you're interested in gardening or nature or nuggets of information about what's happening outside your door, settle in. Enjoy the conversation. Whatever the season, we have something to say. I'm Tim Kennelty. And I'm Jean Thomas. And welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. We have a really good episode today, don't we, Jean? Yes, we do. We've got a bunch of little short things. We love little short things. Little short things. (laughs) The first one is talking about Made in the Shade. It's our first episode of Made in the Shade, all about shade gardening with Barbara Bravo. And she's starting out with a very clever idea, defining shade. I think that's important because there's all different kinds of deep shade and part shade, and a lot of times you'll see on plant labels, part shade, part sun. She's really going to talk about what those things mean. And don't forget dappled shade. Dappled shade. I mm-hmm. like that. And then we go to cooking patch to plate. I love patch to plate with Annie. Annie always talks about food. We love that. Yeah. And she's going to talk about winter squash. Yeah. Winter squash is wonderful stuff. Winter squash are really neat looking. All the different kinds there are. And even a novice like me, vegetable gardener novice, I can grow squash. Squash is not that hard to grow. Yeah. They're fairly idiot proof. And I think cooking wise, they're fairly idiot proof. Although maybe Annie would disagree. I don't think so. Well, we'll see when she talks about it today. And then we talked to Devin about in like a lion and out like a lamb. Is that true? Or is it out like a lamb and in like a... Is that true, though? Is that true? Oh, that's why it's a myth, right? That's that's how it qualifies That's what we're going to find out. Yeah, Yeah. and it's all interpretive, which most myths tend to be. And with climate change, it could be in like a lion and out like a lion. Who knows? We'll find out. All of the above. So this sounds like a really fun episode. I'm going to go sit in the kitchen and wait for the recipes. Me too. Hi, and welcome to Made for the Shade, a recurring feature of Nature Calls that delves into the challenges and rewards of shade gardening. I'm Barbara Bravo, a Master Gardener volunteer with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Ulster County. Making observations about shade on your property or backyard will be very helpful when deciding what kind of shade you have and choosing the right plants for your shady conditions. Shade can take many forms. Shade moves throughout the day as the sun moves across the sky. Since it is always changing, we need to monitor those shady spots. It will help us identify the type of shade we have. I thought it would be a good idea to define the different kinds of shade we might find on our properties. A favorite book of mine by Larry Hodgins, Making the Most of Shade, How to Plan, Plant, and Grow a Fabulous Garden that Lightens Up the Shadows, explains it this way. Light shade is a kind of shade you might find along the edges of a woodland. It is a place where plants receive 5 to 10 hours of direct sunlight. Partial shade can be found in open woods and small clearings. Plants receive less than 5 to 6 hours of direct sunlight and are shaded for at least half the day with 4 or more hours of morning light. So, if 4 or more of the 6 hours are in the afternoon, it is considered full sun. Deep shade rarely receives direct sun. Here are some examples where walls or building overhangs block out the sun and coniferous forest. The most severe dense shade occurs under spruce, pine, Norway maples, and beech trees. In garden designer and lecturer C. Colston Burrell's article, Distinguishing Degrees of Light and Shade, published in Fine Gardening Magazine's Project Guides, He describes shade in the affirmative as some degree of relief from the sun. Just to keep this brief, Burrell, who agrees with Larry, adds these observations. In full shade, direct sun is reduced to one hour 
and in deep shade there is seldom any direct sunlight that reaches the ground. There are more variables depending on season, time of the day, and distance from the equator. Also, light is cumulative. A garden bed that receives sun in the morning and late afternoon, but not during the middle part of the day, may be considered full sun. No wonder we get baffled when attempting to define shade and making decisions about what to plant. When compared to full sun gardens and the exuberant growth of plants suited to that type of direct sunlight, there are benefits to reap regarding shade. Fewer weeds, that means we can spend our valuable time doing things we really love to do. Less watering demands, with seasonal droughts becoming more common, situations in plants that call for less water will continue to be top of the shopping list. In shady areas, blooms last longer and are not bleached out by strong sunlight. Since plants growing in shady conditions grow more slowly, they usually require less fertilizer. Foliage plays a significant role in the shade garden. A variety of shapes and textures common to shade gardens will create a restful garden and a cool refuge during the heat of summer. The perfect spot for a favorite lawn chair. Until next time, I'm Barbara Bravo. listening to Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. Stay tuned for Patch to Plate. Hi and welcome. As a tie-in to the recurring segment from the Veggie Patch, today we'll continue our Patch to Plate talks about using ingredients from your vegetable garden or farmer's market. I'm Annie Skabinski, a Master Gardener volunteer with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Greene Counties. First on my mind today is winter squash. In addition to the familiar butternut and acorn winter squash, there are a staggering variety of different fruit shapes, sizes, and colors. Winter squash is fairly easy to grow, but it can take up a lot of space in the garden. If your space is tight, there are bush varieties. Listen in on episode 5 to hear from Jean Thomas about how to read seed catalogs, and that'll help you pick a variety that'll work for you. There's also more on growing winter squash in Teresa Golden's Veggie Patch segment included in episode 36. Growing guides for these and many, many other veggies are available from a link in the show notes on the website. Winter squash, particularly butternut, and closely related varieties like honey nut have real flavor affinities with sage, onion, and salt, and they pair well with brown butter, parmesan, nutmeg, cinnamon, sugar, thyme, and acids like lemon and lime, vinegar, wine. Look for recipes that include combinations of these ingredients, and when you see them highlighted, you increase your odds on creating a tasty dish. Preheat your oven to 375 to 400, somewhere in that range is ideal, and roast your butternut. I offer a range here, recognizing you might be using your oven for another purpose, and the squash won't suffer from more or less heat, though the roasting time will, of course, vary. To prep, you can cut the butternut in half lengthwise. Spray it with oil or rub it with oil, season it with salt and pepper, or, as I do, you can pierce it several times to create steam vents and roast it whole. Either way, roast it on a sheet pan until the squash is soft. Pierce it with a knife to test doneness. It should slide easily and deeply into the squash. While the squash is roasting, saute onion, garlic, and a little sage in your soup pot. You can do this in olive oil or pan spray. When the squash is roasted nice and soft, remove the skin, discard the seeds, and stringy pulp. Puree the squash with the sauteed onion mixture and add your vegetable stock. You can puree this in the soup pot using an immersion blender or in a standard blender when the soup is cool enough to handle. Then you, of course, have to reheat it. Season to taste with salt and pepper. Consider adding a dash of cinnamon or cayenne or chili oil or a squeeze of lime. If you don't add any of that to the pot, grate a little Parmesan on top of each bowl when you serve it. Next, celebrate soup weather. That's it. The next recipe we want to talk about uses the humble cabbage. 
Roasting cabbage, just like roasting broccoli or Brussels sprouts, helps to bring out the natural sweetness and nuttiness, and it also gives you nice textures and color contrasts. To prepare this recipe, you'll need a really hot oven, so set it to preheat at 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Cut the cabbage into six or eight wedges. Place the wedges on a baking sheet in a single layer. Drizzle or spray with olive oil and sprinkle lightly with salt and pepper. Flip the wedges, repeat the oil, salt and pepper. Get them into the hot oven and roast for 10 minutes until lightly browned. Then take them out, flip them, and roast for an additional 10 minutes or so until deeply brown and tender. That's the basic recipe, though I like to serve it with walnuts. So during the last three minutes of roasting, I add a handful, maybe half a cup of walnuts to the sheet pan and allow them to toast too. When I bring them out of the oven, I give them a rough chop and sprinkle them on the warm cabbage for added texture and nutty goodness. Other great accompaniments for this cabbage include toasted seeds like caraway or pumpkin or a drizzle of apple cider vinegar or honey mustard vinaigrette. There are more butternut squash soup recipes as well as cabbage-centric recipes for sauerkraut and Hungarian red cabbage at our Master Gardener's Cookbook. You can call the office if you'd like to buy a copy. For other recipes, please go to the nutrition page at our Cornell website. Enjoy. That's it for this edition of From Patch to Plate. I'm Annie Skabinski. You're listening to Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. Stay tuned for Hits and Mitts. Hello, this is Devin Russ. I'm a Master Gardener volunteer with the Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Greene Counties, and I'm here with an episode of Hits and Myths. Today I'm going to talk about the old saying, March comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. Have you ever heard this? There's certainly a lot of different March weather in our area. Some years I am out shoveling snow and chopping ice in March. Some years I'm out planting peas and lettuce, maybe both in the same March. Does that old saying mean that I should expect that a snowy beginning to March will be balanced by a warm and dry ending? I don't think so. Although we do expect the beginning of the month to have more in common with winter and the end of the month to have more in common with spring, there's no reason to expect any sort of balance. Just because March starts with snow doesn't mean it can't also end with snow. And if March starts with sunny days, it could still end with sunny days. One reason why a phrase like this has so much staying power and seems like a good prediction is that it's very vague. When a statement is vague, you can't pin it down and say, look, it was wrong this year. When you say, March comes in like a lion, there's no definition of what coming in means. The first day? Or maybe the first week of March? And is it like a lion if it's very snowy and windy? Or is it enough to just be cold? And when March goes out like a lamb... Does that mean that March 31st is warm and sunny, or just that there is some pleasant weather in the last week? With March weather being so changeable, if you think of the whole first week as being the beginning of March, it will often be true that March has both lion and lamb at the beginning, the same at the end of the month. There really is no precision in saying, in like a lion, out like a lamb. Weather in our air is changing throughout the spring as the days get longer. The official end of winter happens in March. That is the spring equinox, usually March 21st. The spring equinox is one of just two days, the other comes six months later in September, when there are exactly 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness. After the spring equinox, the days are longer than nights, and the extra sunshine makes us warmer. Days continue getting longer until the 21st of June, the summer solstice, which is the longest day and the beginning of summer. These changes in day length happen each year as our Earth travels around the sun and our northern hemisphere is tilted more towards or more away from the sun. That relationship to the sun drives all weather. The change from one month to the next, however, is arbitrary. It's the way our calendar divides the seasons into smaller chunks. There's no reason to think that weather systems would line up with a change in the name of the month. Imagine, for instance, that a big winter storm is heading our way in late February. It might get here on February 28th, 
and then the sun comes out the next day. So March comes in like a lamb. But if the storm moves a bit more slowly, it arrives on March 1st, and March comes in like a lion. This proverb has been popular for centuries. I think one reason why it has so much staying power is that it's fun to say. I like the way lion and lamb both begin with the letter L. That makes it easy to remember, and it sounds very balanced, like a bit of poetry. Having the lion and the lamb in the same sentence also brings to mind some beautiful images. There is a well-loved passage in the Bible often remembered as, The lion shall lie down with the lamb, and a little child shall lead them. The Bible passage actually pairs different animals, but lion and lamb captures its message, promising a future time of peace and safety, when even predators and prey will live together without bloodshed. A famous painting, The Peaceable Kingdom, made by the American Quaker artist Edward Hicks almost 200 years ago, interprets that passage by showing a lush landscape with children and animals of many kinds, including the lamb and the lion. I think beautiful images like that have a lot to do with why this proverb is still current. We enjoy saying, March comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. It's not a weather forecast, but it is a proverb that recalls some beautiful images, and it captures the crazy swings of March weather. Thank you. This is another episode of Hits and Myths. That concludes another episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. We would like to thank Sandra Linnell and Devin Connolly from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Greene Counties for production support. And a special thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. You can find links to any of the topics mentioned in this episode at our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org. Comments and suggestions for future topics may be directed to us at Columbia Green MGB at Cornell.edu or on the CCE Master Gardener Volunteers of Columbia and Green County's Facebook page. For more information about Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties, visit our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org or visit us in Hudson or in Acre. Cornell Cooperative Extension provides equal programming and employment opportunities. 